Amen. And Lord, we know it's not fun to be broken, but Lord, we know that in brokenness you become so near to us and so real. And Lord, you provide your grace, which is sufficient. And we see, Lord, that your weak that your strength is made perfect in our weaknesses, Lord, and in our brokenness. And so, Lord, we thank you even for the times of brokenness today. And we pray, Lord, that we would learn to receive brokenness, and, and even, Lord, thank you for it in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. You can be seated and grab your Bibles this morning. We'll be in Hebrews chapter 12. Welcome to Calvary Chapel. I'm so glad you guys are here with us this morning, worshiping, studying God's word, running the race of faith, amen? amen. Well, this morning, before I get into the word, I want to remind us all that Today's an exciting day. Our School of Discipleship and Ministry is kicking off. We have uh, about 14 or 15 uh, men in our pastoral ministry class. That class will be, be yeah, praise the Lord. Hey, who knows what God's going to do with that, right? I'm excited. But that class is going to be moved back to 2 p.m. just for today. The rest of the other Sundays it will be at 1 p.m. Uh, as advertised. The reason for that is we have a board meeting today. The board of directors is meeting today. And so uh, that's the reason for the time change just for today for the pastoral ministry class. So guys, please uh, remember that. And then next Sunday, we'll be back to the regular time. Also, Tuesday evening, we are starting the inductive Bible study class, uh, which, which has uh, around 30 35 people in that class, more or less, um, the last time I checked the roster. So uh, very excited about that class as well. That will be from, uh, and I made a mistake announcing this last week, so here's the correct time. That will be from 6 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. on Tuesday evening. 6 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. Tuesday evening. And that will be uh, in the second and third grade classroom. Second and third grade classroom. So Tuesday night, 6 to 7.30 for inductive Bible study class with Paul Jackamack, and then, uh, uh, and that will continue every Tuesday night for the next 10 weeks. With that, let's go ahead and pray, guys, and I want to get into the word with you this morning. Heavenly Father, we just come before you with uh, a humble heart, Lord, just asking you, Lord, to open up the scriptures to our hearts today, making application through your Holy Spirit speaking to us, Lord, about our lives. And Lord, it's never easy to uh, withstand scrutiny. It's never easy, Lord, to open ourselves up and to become transparent to the point that your spirit can just place his loving finger on those areas of our heart that need to change. But Lord, today we want to do that. We want to humble ourselves. We want to open ourselves to you. Knowing you, you see everything anyways, Lord, we might as well just let the walls down and take the roof off today so that you can see into the heart of hearts and, Lord, you can make adjustments as necessary. Lord, not one of us measures up to your standard, but, Lord, that's not the point because you've made provision for that through Jesus. But, but we are to be striving for or, or running the race of faith to win, not striving in the sense of the flesh, but, but, Lord, learning to rest in you. So I just pray for the church today, those listening online, that we would hear your message and grow. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. amen. Let's read verses 1 and 2 together, uh, all together. Uh, I'll read the New King James Version loudest, Okay. So let, let's all try and read that together this morning. Hebrews 12, verse 1 and 2 says, Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Wow, what powerful verses that we're studying this morning. How many of you guys are runners here today? We got a few runners out there. 
Anybody like to say run more than a mile? Okay, you guys are crazy. <laughs> but this message will be quite interesting for you because we see a great analogy of running the race. Now, of course, as I said, if you run anything, say over two or three miles, I, I really do think you're crazy. I ran track for one year in high school. I did it to improve my speed for football, of course, the next fall, but I stayed away from all that long distance stuff until I got in the Marines and then they made me do it, right? <laughs> but I ran the 100 meter dash when I was in, in track in high school and I can still remember the feeling of going out into the lanes and setting up my blocks and getting down in, in position, excited, ready to run, waiting for the, the, the crack of the gun there as the starter would yell two year marks and the crowd would kind of grow silent there as they, in anticipation and we would get down and then boom, that gun would go off and we would take off and the next 10 seconds was kind of like, yo, Adrian, you know, <laughs> running that race, kind of a blur. But at the end of the race, it was always the same for me anyways. I'd cross the finish line with a bunch of other guys in front of me. I was one of the slower guys out there for the sprints. And there was always the moms at the end of the finish line too, you know, saying things like, oh, you fast, honey, you know, and. Ain't nobody going to catch my baby, right? Of course, those comments were never meant for me. If my mom was there, she was telling me, you got to unhook the trailer, son, you know? <laughs> so I was so slow. You might wonder why I continue to run these races if I was always getting beat. But the reason was this. I knew in my own mind every time I ran... I was going to run to win whether I was going to get beat or not. And I knew I was probably going to get beat, but I didn't care. I was going to run that race and hopefully push myself to be a little bit better, a little bit faster. In our text today in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, we see the subject being presented to us that in, as an analogy. The Christian life is likened to a long-distance race. So it's not a sprint, it's a long distance race. In fact, we're going to see it's a daily race in which we're to keep looking unto Jesus by faith all the way to the finish line. In this race, we see at least three things that we need to pay attention to. There are the witnesses, the runners, and then most importantly, the motive for running. So these three things unpack our points that we will follow today in this message. And we start with the witnesses in verse 1, the very first part of verse 1, where it says, Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. Therefore, the very first word of the verse reminds us of the context you see, this analogy of the race of faith is tied directly to the persons we have studied in chapter 11. This tells us that no matter what age or dispensation a believer is living their life, the race has been the same for all people in all places in all of human history. So let that sink down into your hearts this morning, my friends. Because we also, here, now, listening to the word of God, are called to run the race of faith. You have a race to run. And like the men and women of chapter 11, it's not always going to be easy. It's not always going to be pretty. It's not always going to look neat and organized. You're not always going to feel great. You might not even always feel blessed. But nevertheless, my friend, you have a race to run. Are you aware of that this morning? And are you running to win? Or have you let complacency and apathy crowd out that desire to please the one who's called you into this race? Next, the writer of Hebrews shows us that we're not alone in this race. He says, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. So the picture that is being painted here by the writer of Hebrews is of a stadium 
filled with spectators who are surrounding the runners of this race. They're surrounding the track that the runners are going to run on. Now, of course, this is a, uh, uh, we have to remember the context here. The, this was the time of the Greek Olympiad, the games, when the spectators would crowd into the stadiums and they would watch these games. And there were different games. There was this style of wrestling. There was a, a boxing. There was running. There were, there were uh, about nine or ten different games that the Greeks would participate in. And, and so this, of course, begs the question, well, who are the great cloud of witnesses that are packed into this stadium here? Well, this group of people, this great cloud of witnesses, is actually speaking of all the Old Testament men and women of God who, by their very lives, prove to you and I that the race can be won. If you look back at the previous chapter, you see it is commonly referred to as the Hall of Faith. And it is in chapter 11 that you see the great cloud of witnesses being referred to. Remember what I said, this verse 1 is linked directly to chapter 11. The whole chapter of chapter 11 is devoted to the encouragement of you and I as believers. You see, I used to think that chapter 11 was full of men and women that I was supposed to try to aspire to be like. But that is not completely the point. Each one of the accounts of chapter 11 is meant also to encourage in fact, primarily, they're meant to encourage you and I. See, there were different people in different situations that are no different than us. They went through things similar to our lives. They faced similar challenges, similar trials, sicknesses, death, persecutions. Now, often at a much greater scale, the persecution, but at the same time, in their weakness, God manifested his strength. And we can all relate with that. And so here we see that chapter 11 is meant to encourage us. They are the great cloud of witnesses that we are surrounded by. Now a witness, specifically Paul, or the writer of Hebrews, I almost slipped up there, not Paul, but the writer of Hebrews, he says specifically witnesses. He doesn't say crowd. He doesn't say spectators. A witness is someone who testifies to the truth of what they've seen or heard or know to be true. Their testimonies, their stories are meant to encourage the runners of this race. So this cloud of witnesses proclaims to you here today that you are not alone, my friend. The difficulty that you face, the trial that you find yourself in the midst of, the suffering in your life, you are not alone because these men and women rise from the pages of Scripture and they tell you it can be done. You can do this. You can make it. Think of Abel, Enoch, Noah, the trials, the adversities that they faced. Think of Abraham and Sarah waiting for the child of promise, being led by the Lord from place to place, living in a tent for years. Think of Isaac and Jacob struggling to find their way, struggling to understand this God that had called them out and had given them covenant promises. Think of Joseph spending time in prison because of his brothers. Think of their stories. Think of Moses and Joshua and Rahab. Guys, every one of them there in chapter 11 testifies to you and I today that we, like them, can finish our race, that we can win. They're encouraging us through the Holy Spirit, telling you and I that this life of faith can be lived, the race can be won. They showed us that they did it. And if they did it, we too can find ourselves resting in God's promise of salvation, which he performed for us. That's what they did. They weren't perfect, but they rested in the promise that God was going to save them. And we can rest in Christ Jesus and finish our race by faith today as well. So we've looked now at the spectators. Let's observe the runners the runners, that's the second part of verse one. It says, therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, 
let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. So here, the writer is setting the scene for us. And it is a scene that would have been familiar to those who received this letter to the Hebrews. It's the imagery of the Greek games. The stadium is full of spectators, or for our purposes, the witnesses, right? And they're cheering us on. Now we look to see the athletes who have come out to participate in the race, and they're taking their places, getting ready to go. And I forgot to tell you this, but Greek athletes, they were naked. They were stark naked. Didn't matter if you were boxing, wrestling, or running, you participated in the games naked. That is how they would compete with nothing hindering, nothing weighing them down. Now, like any athlete, thankfully God isn't asking us to run naked, but he does require preparation and endurance, my friends. There is an element of preparation and endurance for the daily race that we're to run. There are truths that transfer from the physical realm to your spiritual walk with the Lord. And one of those is that you need to be preparing for an enduring race. You need to be training, my friends. Why would we think that these athletes that we witnessed in the the Olympics just recently, those that win medals... And they talk about what they do for training. And they they tell us what they do. And we go, oh my goodness, man, that's your life. And they're like, yeah, no duh, you know. If you don't make this your life, you don't stand on that podium. The hours of training that they put in, the blood, sweat, and tears that goes into that preparation for the game. Guys, it's no different. This transfers over into our spiritual life as well. As Christians, there is something to be said about us training, us preparing. Now, we always rest in the finished work of Jesus Christ. Don't get me wrong. But there is something to be said about memorizing Scripture, meditating on God's word, meeting together in fellowship, having a brother or sister that holds you accountable, all of these sorts of things that the Bible prescribes for you and I that are preparation for the daily race. They're meant to help us. They're meant to prepare us because our race is a conflict that requires that kind of preparation We have to learn to lay aside certain things, the Bible tells us. Specifically, here, the writer of Hebrews gives us two things. First of all, sin. I want to talk about sin first before weights because it's a little bit clearer and more easily identified. See, the Bible clearly identifies sin as missing the mark. It's missing God's standard. And guys, we can all identify that in our lives. If you can't, uh, then come see me afterwards. We need to talk. I'll explain the Ten Commandments to you, basically. But listen, you cannot expect to get very far at all in this race of Christianity if you are trying to run with unconfessed sin in your heart. Notice what verse 1 tells us about sin. It says that it easily ensnares us. That word ensnares, if you want to circle that and write out on the margin of your Bible, skillfully surrounds on all sides. That's what ensnares means, skillfully surrounds on all sides. In other words, the enemy working together with the world and your flesh knows how to skillfully surround you. On all sides. And and the idea behind skillfully surrounding on all sides is that it inhibits your actions. It inhibits or hinders you from being able to do what God has called you to do. Sin bears down so heavily from above. 
and surrounds so tightly from the sides that we cannot move forward in the race until we have dealt with it first. That is what the writer is telling you and I today. Dealing with sin. Laying aside sin. Now, this is possible because of the cross, isn't it? Jesus Christ has made it possible for us to lay aside the sin. Praise God for that. Because if you don't have Jesus, then you're surrounded on all sides by sin, and there's nothing you can do about it. But Jesus' blood, once you receive that sacrifice for sin, Jesus' blood cleanses us, and it delivers us from the power and the penalty of sin. And as we surrender to the Lord and deal with our sins, we are able to move forward. Now, dealing with sin is a daily thing for most of us. Guess what? Don't, don't lose heart in that. It was the same way for the cloud of witnesses too. The cloud of witnesses that went before us dealt with sin too. So don't lose heart. Jesus died to deal with our sins and in him we have forgiveness for whatever we ask. His blood never fails us. Check out the promise of 1 John, verse 1, in verse 9, or I'm sorry, 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Guys, the proper attitude towards sin is not to go, oh, man, I sinned again. I might as well just do it again and again and again. I might as well just fall in this and stay in my sin for days since I messed up again. That's not the proper attitude for sin. That's condemnation. Oh, this, the enemy loves that. He loves it when you get in that funk because then he's got, he goes, oh, I got a victim here. Yeah, poor me. That's not how we're, we're to deal with sin. The proper Christian attitude towards sin is not to deny it, but to admit it and then to receive the forgiveness which God has made possible and promises to us. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess, if we'll admit, Lord, I did this. Lord, I, I know that I made this, I committed this sin. And we name it. Lord, I did this. And we name that sin. We confess it specifically to the Lord. Guess what? He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. My brother, my sister, if we don't deal with sin every day, then it's clear we won't make progress in the race. It would not make sense to even begin to run that daily race unless you have straightened out your relationship with the one who's going to be rewarding you at the end of that race. So we need to ask Jesus to cleanse us, and then we need to get going. Don't be discouraged by this daily procedure. Think of it as brushing your teeth or cleaning your toilet or whatever it is that you do every day. Flush the sin away, right? <sighs> Just remember that the daily race of endurance is a marathon. It is not a sprint. And so we need to deal with sin that entangles us and inhibits us from making progress. The second thing that we see here is the word wait. This is the second thing that we're told to lay aside. The word in the Greek refers to a mass or a burden which impedes or hinders a person from either taking action or making progress. So the word wait talks of an impeding or a hindrance that keeps us from taking action, making progress. Now it's clear in the context the writer means for us to take this as a metaphor for anything in our lives which hinders or impedes our life of faith. You can imagine how silly it would look for someone to show up to run a marathon with a big bulky backpack on, right? Or maybe carrying a couple of 45 pound weights in their hands, you know, and walking up to the starting line. Or even just 10 pound weights or five pound weights. It doesn't matter. It wouldn't be 
expedient to the runner. Unfortunately, though, this is how many Christians attempt to run the race of faith. They attempt to run with all sorts of unnecessary baggage. What are the weights that hinder us from running our race? Well, I can't tell you specifically as pertains to your life what those weights are. I can tell you what some of my weights are that I deal with. But oftentimes, these weights are tied into gray areas in the scriptures. These are often Christian liberty issues, which if you're not walking in the spirit, they can easily hinder your progress in the faith. Now, I'm going to mention a few things here. Some of you may agree, you may disagree, but I've seen these things as weights in people's lives, alcohol, tobacco use, entertainment, the, the, the stuff that people are taking in, uh, including video games here, guys. Yep, I grew up with video games. Video games can be a hindrance. They can be a weight. They can be something that impedes. Now, some of you that are the older generation, you look at the younger guys like me and you go, that's a joke. You, you really struggle with that? But hey, I'm here to tell you, we grew up with that stuff. Blame you, you guys, because my dad got that for me. Did you buy one for your kids? Then why are you looking at me like that? <clears throat> you introduced that whole struggle. But those things can be an issue. What about fashion or style? That can become a weight that hinders somebody. What about music? There was a time in my life where listening to secular music was really weighing me down. It was filling my mind. And, and, and some of it was sin. Some of it was straight sin. But some of it was a Christian liberty issue that I was getting too much into that. And so finally I had to get rid of all that stuff. The Lord challenged me. A weight can also be something that starts out as a blessing but then gets out of balance in your life like a friendship or perhaps a romantic relationship. When that person becomes everything and, and you're spending time with only them and, 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 well, there's a point where that becomes necessary, but if that becomes greater than your relationship with the Lord, right, that can become a weight that hinders and you need to bring that back into proper balance. The point is, when we're talking about weights, it's your relationship with the Holy Spirit that is going to make the difference. Because it's the Holy Spirit that is going to put his finger on the things that are a weight in your personal life. That's why I said I can't name all the weights that could possibly out there. I don't know what's hindering you. I know what hinders me. So pray about that. Are there weights in your life right now? I'm asking you. You need to seriously seek the Lord about that. Pray about it, think it through, and then follow through. We need to lay those things aside. Secondly, our race is a race that requires endurance. We're told, let us lay aside sin and wait, and let us run with endurance. Two exhortations there. The word for race is actually agone. Agone, and that word in the Greek is, is used to describe conflict, something that is a conflict. In fact, the Apostle Paul used it several times in his writings, and it helps us to understand what kind of conflicts we might face in the race of faith. In Philippians chapter 1, verse 30, it refers to striving and suffering. I'm sorry, sufferings. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 1, it refers to his strivings on behalf of the Colossian believers. How he agonized in prayer over them and over the things that were going on in their lives. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 2, he uses the same word in, in regards to the opposition that he encountered as he preached the gospel and ministered to the people there. And then in 1 Timothy chapter 6, 12, and 2 Timothy 4, 7, he uses the same word to describe the fight of faith. It's a conflict. 
Then we look at the word endurance. So not just the word race, which is a conflict, but also the word endurance. This helps us to understand what we've gotten ourselves into. The word endurance means, or in the Greek is hupomone, and it means to remain under steadfast endurance. It carries the idea of hopefulness and patience as you endure a trial or suffering. Now, some of you that are new believers, you might be looking at this and going, what in the world have I gotten myself into? This is not going to be easy. Again, remember the saints of chapter 11. Men and women just like us. Men and women with facing struggles, facing uh, 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 sicknesses, facing death, facing persecution. They lived in a fallen, sin-filled world too. They dealt with their flesh. They dealt with the world around them. They dealt with the devil uh, uh, working against them. But they made it. They made it. Now, the last thing I want you to notice here is that the race that we're all running is a race not of our own making. The word says the race that is set before us. There in verse one, let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Each one of us has to run our own race. We can't be jealous of someone else's life. We can't be jealous and, and, and bitter that somebody else's life seems to be easier from our perspective. We're not to compare ourselves with other believers and go, well, Lord, how come you're blessing them but not blessing me? Or how come my race has to be this way? Or why, was I, uh, why do I have this handicap or this issue or problem or thorn in the flesh? Guys, that's not the point. We're to run the race that God has set before us. Just as that person is called to run the race that God set before them. And trust me, you don't know everything that's going on in their life. You can't see what is happening behind the scenes or know the future, the future trial that God may have for that person that he may allow in their life. Next, in verse two, we see the motive for running. This is the most important part of today's message, the motive as to why we are running the race. We're told in verse two, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So who are we looking to? Simply to Jesus. We're not looking to Fox News or CNN. We're not looking to President Biden. We're not looking to the Republican Party either. We're not looking to these things of this world. We are told here in this verse that if you are running the daily race of faith, there is one object of your faith that we are looking to, and that is Jesus. The Greek word for looking unto means to look without distractions. It refers to looking at one thing to the exclusion of all else. Now, in a race, you want to have a focus on the finish line in order to finish well. Classic bad race running is the guy that's running like this, looking behind him, right? Because, number one, he, he risks that going into the other lane when he's looking right. And number two, as he's looking back, he's not striving and straining for the prize. And the guy that is catching up to him is going to blow right by him. In a race, you want to focus on the finish. We need to have a single-mindedness if we're to finish well. That's the point of the writer of Hebrews here in this verse. Have a single-mindedness. The central figure of our focus must be a knowable being. And that being, we're told, is Jesus we're told to focus on our relationship with him. We're to focus on knowing him. That's what we've been instructed in the book of Hebrews. Christ has been presented as supreme. 
Christ Jesus is better than all else. And because he is better, we are just, we're running this race, looking to him, getting to know him, drawing close to him, being transformed into his image. Why are we looking to him? Well, we look to Jesus because, first of all, he's the author and finisher of our faith. The word author means he's the initiator. God is the one who initiates salvation. God initiated salvation in that he sent his only begotten son to die on the cross that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God is the initiator and the finisher of salvation. Jesus is the cornerstone on which our faith is built. That word author can also mean founder. And in that sense, we look to Jesus because he's the founder, the foundation, the cornerstone of faith. As the finisher, we're reminded he has trailblazed away for us and sat down at the right hand of God. He has finished the work. And as we look to him as the author and finisher, we're reminded that it's not up to us to strive. It's not up to us to to do this on our own. We're to rest in his finished work. Secondly, we're told to look to him because he's our, our savior who, for the joy of our salvation, Now, notice that phrase, the joy of our salvation, or or for the joy that was set before him. That joy in view is you. The joy in view here is us. The joy that Jesus has in view that was set before him is the relationships with the believers in the church. It's our lives being lived by faith, just like the Old Testament saints of old. So for the prospect of of saving you and saving me and knowing us, Jesus, it says, accomplished three things for us. He endured the cross, he despised the shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of, of, of God. This means that Jesus did not ignore the shame and the difficulty of the cross. Get this, he didn't ignore it, but that he thought it to be of lesser consequence than the joy that was set before him the joy of saving and knowing you. Notice with me that the object of our faith, Jesus, he also had to endure the suffering of the cross. That was his race. But notice the end result of his race. He sat down at the right hand of God in heaven. My friends, we too will have to endure our race to the end. But know this, it is worth it. God has accomplished our salvation for us. And we need to learn to rest in his finished work in Jesus as he has blazed the trail and shown us the way and made it possible. In fact, he's the anchor of our soul, we're told in Hebrews. He's the anchor of our soul in the holy of holies. And if we cling to him, one day we will be with him forever. In doing so, we will win the prize. And that brings me to the conclusion of our message this morning. How do we win this race? How do we win this race that we're running? Well, the way you win is finishing by faith. The same way you started. This isn't a worldly race, guys, where there's only one finisher who receives the prize, the first place guy. This isn't even a a participation trophy thing where just because you stepped out on the track, you get something. It's not a worldly race. It's a spiritual race. Success simply means you finished the way you started, by faith. Now, the most exciting times of a race is the beginning and the end. But most of us in this room today are probably not in those stages. If you are in the beginning of the race, praise the Lord. I praise God that he's worked in your life to get you started here. Some of you in this room might be near the end, but only God truly knows that. But that's an exciting time too, because you're getting ready to cross that finish line. 
and you're looking at Jesus, and, and you know, hey, Lord, I, I've, I've run this race by faith. Not perfect, but I'm trusting you, trusting your finished work. But many of us here today are right in the middle of this race. And that's not as exciting. In fact, in a marathon, you get out of the stadium and you're kind of just running the streets alone. Maybe a few runners around you. I wouldn't know by experience. But I've been told you can hit a wall when you're running a marathon. That your body gets to a place where you just want to quit and you want to give up and you don't think you have any more. But if you keep going, they say, pretty soon, all of that just falls away. And you begin to realize, no, I can do this. So finishing by faith, it, it, that, that's how you started the race. That's how you're to finish, and that's how you're to go through it. You're not leaning on your own understanding. You're not relying on your own righteousness. You're not thinking more highly of yourself than you ought to. You're learning to rest in the grace of God by faith. You know it's not about your works. It's not about your performance. It's about your relationship by faith. So are you doing this today? Let me apply this passage as I close. <clears throat> First of all, let me ask you, are you being encouraged by the great cloud of witnesses? The great cloud of witnesses is found right here in the Bible, guys. And so you learn of them, you are encouraged of them as you read and as the Holy Spirit makes application through the word of God to encourage your heart in your race. Are you daily reading and meditating on the word of God, guys? I know I say it a lot here, but I don't care. I'll beat that dead horse till I die. Amen. Read the Bible, guys. This is how you are encouraged by the great cloud of witnesses. Do it daily. Secondly, are you preparing and training for your daily race? Are you laying aside the weight and the sin? That should be a daily uh, uh, examination in our lives. Lord, is there, is there sin, unconfessed sin this morning? As you get up in the morning and you spend time in the word and the Holy Spirit puts his finger on something, Lord, I confess that right now. I want to get right. I don't even want to start the race today until I've confessed my sin. And, and Lord, is there any weights? Is there anything that's hindering me and just, you know, encumbering me? That encumbrance that's keeping me from running free for you. And as the Holy Spirit puts that on your heart, you take steps. You take steps to lay that aside so it's not hindering your walk, your race. Thirdly, are you running your race set before you with contentment? Or are you bitter and jealous, looking at somebody else's race, comparing your race with theirs? Listen, it's never a good idea to compare. It's never a good idea. In fact, the Apostle Paul spoke about that in Corinthians. He said, I, I never compare myself with any of these other guys because it's the Lord that judges us. And so we're to run our race for him. Third, or fourthly, what is your motive for running? What's your motive for running the race? Are you looking to Jesus? If you are, then you know that you too are also daily gonna have to take up your cross and follow him. When we look to Jesus, we see it's not gonna be easy, but we also see the reward. That's my last application today. Always remember the reward, guys. Are you remembering the reward? Let's run our race by faith, looking to Jesus, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Let's pray. Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters here today that they would find themselves running their race to win. Lord, that doesn't mean they're striving in their flesh but it means, Lord, that they're resting in your grace, that they're resting in you, Jesus, focused on you, looking to you, enduring their cross, despising the shame, knowing that the reward is coming. Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters today that you'd encourage their hearts, that you would build them up, 
that you would edify them in their race of faith. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Let's stand to our feet as we close with this song.